hey, there's this range of traditional diets. Let's start in the middle. What did they all share in common and what was, you know, what is most likely to be in line with my own heritage and constitution and genetics? And then we tweak it from there. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Tota Labrata Gore. This is episode number 28, and my guest today is Chris Masterjohn. Chris has a brilliant mind. He has a PhD in nutritional sciences and is currently an assistant professor of health and nutrition sciences at Brooklyn College in New York. In our conversation today, Chris gives us the skinny on fat. What I mean is that he helps us get a better grip on our understanding of fat and its role in our bodies. He has a fresh, common sense approach on diet that I think you're going to love. Wise Traditions is supported by New Trends Publishing, home of nourishing traditions and other fine books on diet and health. Go to NewTrendsPublishing.com. And the Wise Traditions Conference. Hear speakers like those featured on these podcast episodes at the Wise Traditions Conference in Montgomery, Alabama, November 11th through the 14th. Learn, eat well, and have fun. Go to WiseTraditions.org for details. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Chris. Thank you so much, Phil. That's great to be here. So I really want to chew the fat with you, pun intended, today. I want to really <laughs> talk about fat because it's all the rage, but I need you to help me and the listeners understand it better. You know, I hear about saturated fat and trans fats, and there's just so much going on in the world of fat. Can you help us make sense of it all? Sure. You know, fat is something that's very important. Fat is a major energy storage depot in our body, so we tap into our fat supply to burn for energy between meals or during an overnight fast. Uh, fat also plays very important structural roles in our body. So uh, we are made of many, many <laughs> billions, if not trillions of cells. And each of those cells have all kinds of working parts within them. And all of those working parts are enclosed by membranes that are made of fats. Our, our brain contains... Uh, about a quarter of the fat or so in our body, even though it's only 2% of our body weight. So uh, fat is very important just to thinking and learning and cognition and our emotions and our mental and psychological and emotional health. So fats play a really important, a really important part of our health and physiology. And where do we get fats? Well, we mostly get fats from the fat that we eat in our food. And there are several different types of fats. And each of those types of fats, the broad classes are saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. And within each class of those, there's actually many specific fatty acids. And all of them play essential roles in our body in different amounts. And so it's important not to pick or choose that one type of fat is the good fat or one type of fat is the bad fat. But if you look at the spectrum of traditional diets over the course of human history, in general, it's been the case that diets have either been fairly high, fairly high in carbohydrate mm -hmm. and modest in fat, or they've been fairly high in fat and lower in carbohydrate. And regardless of whether they've been high or low in fat, generally the bulk of the fat has been either from saturated fat and monounsaturated fat or both, mm -hmm. while a small portion has been from polyunsaturated fat. And if you look at the types of foods that those are found in, in general, animal fats are a pretty even mix of saturated and monounsaturated fats. The specific type of animal might vary. So, uh, you know, beef fat and lamb fat is going to be more saturated compared to, say, chicken fat or turkey fat. Uh -huh. uh, but then if you look at plant oils, you'll find that the richest source of saturated fatty acids are actually from the tropical oils. So if you go into the tropical regions, you'll see a lot of coconut. You'll see a lot of palm oil. Uh -huh. uh, these, these are really high in saturated fat. And then if you go into more temperate regions, you'll find more monounsaturated fat. So, for example, in the Mediterranean, there's a lot of olive oil that's very high in monounsaturated fat. What we've seen in the last half century as we've gone from traditional diets to modern diets mm -hmm. is a shift towards 
oils like soybean oil and canola oil and sunflower oil and safflower oil, corn oil, cottonseed oil, these are much, much, much higher in polyunsaturated fat than any of the traditional fats that we've eaten through most of human history. And you could make a strong case, not that polyunsaturated fat is bad, it's actually essential in the body, but that this dramatic shift away from the traditional fats rich in saturated and monounsaturated fat and toward the modern oils that are more polyunsaturated may play a role in a lot of the modern diseases that are now uh, plaguing us in modern society. Wow, Chris. Well, that was a lot of food for thought right there. Um, and one thing you said really surprised me when you said that polyunsaturated fat m may not necessarily be bad. It may just be the quantities we're taking in. Is that, did I hear you right? Is that what you said? Yeah. In fact, you know, historically we've termed the polyunsaturated fat, the essential fatty acids, because those are the fatty acids that we can't make ourselves in the body. But part of the reason that we can't make them in the body is because historically it hasn't been necessary to do that because our requirements for them are actually quite low. If you look at saturated and monounsaturated fats, because they're much more abundant in the body and play a much more prominent role in the, in the physiological processes that promote health, we actually have, you know, human beings are so resilient and adaptive, we actually have our own machinery to make those fats if their levels in the diet drop. And so we don't call them essential because we can't produce a deficiency disease by bringing them down to zero. But that doesn't mean that they're not good for us. We actually, we actually have to have them in our, in our bodies. And so that terminology can be a little bit confusing. Um, but yeah, definitely if you were to take the polyunsaturated fatty acids and bring them down to zero, it'd be really hard to do that on a natural diet. But if you did it, you would definitely cause pretty severe problems. So they are important. Interesting. And the other thing you said was that beef and lamb fat tend to be more saturated than, say, turkey or chicken fat. And are, is this our goal? Is this what we're going for is really the saturated fat from the animals like you're describing? Well, I think saturated fat is very important and it can be very valuable to take it in in the diet. But like I said before, if you look at the range of traditional diets that we came from, they weren't all really high in saturated fat. They, you know, Some of them were really high in saturated fat. And that extreme can be found on the Pacific Islands where they consumed, particularly on the island of Tokelau, where the traditional diet was so rich in coconut that people were deriving over half of their total calories from saturated fat. That is several times what Americans are consuming on average. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there were traditional diets in the Mediterranean region where, yes, they did consume a fair amount of saturated fat, but they consumed more monounsaturated fat because of the particular mix of uh, dietary staples that they had. And there were other traditional diets where carbohydrate was one of the main staples and the level of fat was lower. So I don't think we want to take one of the nutrients and say that's the one that we want. Mm -hmm. um, we really want to get all the nutrients and we want to look at, um, okay, there's this range of traditional diets. Let's start in the middle. What did they all share in common and what was, you know, w what is most likely to be in line with my own heritage and constitution and genetics? And then we tweak it from there, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, uh, some people may want to increase their saturated fat more than whatever the average was in traditional diets, and other people's other people may want to decrease it. I think the really important thing here, and one of the reasons that I've written so much about saturated fat, is not to single it out as the nutrient that everyone needs to focus on, but instead to actually relieve the pressure of focusing on that nutrient. Because what we've done for the last half century is demonize saturated fat. And the fear of saturated fat has been one of the key driving factors in people's food choices because they the, saturated fat and, and cholesterol together. So people look at red meat and they, they are afraid of it because of the saturated fat. People look at the egg and they are afraid of it because of the cholesterol. Mm -hmm. um, we need to take out 
fear out of the equation, right? Fear is very disempowering. What we need to do is recognize that, you know, if it takes a half an hour just to talk about why saturated fat is good for you in order to get people to stop fearing it and make, you know, more rational decisions about their diet that are based on positive principles instead of fear, then I would love to spend that half an hour. But I don't want to leave um, or an hour or sometimes an hour and a half, I'll, I'll talk about these things. But I, uh-huh. but I always want to be careful when I do that to end on the note that it's not all about saturated fat. We need to see that as one of the important contributors to health. But then we also need the freedom to say, okay, you know, maybe butter is what's right for me in this meal, but maybe olive oil is what's right for me in this meal because it tastes better or because I respond better to olive oil or whatever. Oh, that's fantastic. I love where you're going with this because I feel like personally, we can get caught up in the trends. Now, you're right. There used to be a trend saying saturated fat was bad. People were afraid. Now there may be a trend that it's good. And we you know, swing wildly on this pendulum of pursuit of health and wellness, but we're motivated not by, um, you know, trying to get the best stuff in our bodies, but by fear, you know, like, oh my gosh, I don't want to miss the boat. I don't want to get sick with cancer. So I better grab onto this saturated fat train. But you're saying it's an important part of our diet, but we don't need to get compelled about it all, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a, there's a time to point out all the great things that it's doing in our body and that what that needs to move us toward is a is a recognition that it is one small component of a good and and healthy diet and after we get over <laughs> over our fear of saturated fat and we and maybe we use excitement about how delicious butter is and all the great things that butter is doing for us in our bodies maybe that excitement about all those positive things drives us out of that place of fear but once we're out of that place of fear then we need to sort of get over that particular excitement and and become re-excited by the whole spectrum of things that are good for us in our diet. Okay, so let's go back to what you said before about there being something that these traditional diets had in common, that mid-range that we want to look at that we can then tweak for our own bodies and where we live and all that. So what does that mid-range say about our fat requirements? Well, if you look at traditional diets, again, uh, I would say that it really isn't a commonality that they have a specific percentage of fat in the diet. Mm -hmm. But what we can distill as a commonality is that none of these diets were really high in polyunsaturated fat. So if you look at the fats that people are currently consuming, corn and cottonseed oil, not so much anymore, but sunflower, safflower oil are still very common. Soybean oil, canola oil are still very common. If you look at those oils, those oils are well outside that range of commonalities in in traditional diets. Mm -hmm. What do you see if you look at the range of commonalities is a focus on fats like butter, the tropical oils like coconut oil or palm oil, You see olive oil, you see animal fats like lamb fat and beef fat and pig fat and so on, Um, the bird fat you see as well. So you you see this spectrum of fats, but then you also see that the total amount of fat in in the diets has also varied a lot. Mm -hmm. So many traditional diets were relatively high in starch and relatively modest in fat. So I would say that if we try to distill out one commonality among those diets, it's that starch, monounsaturated fat, and or saturated fat are providing a significant bulk of the calories Mm -hmm. with a smaller amount coming from protein and a pretty small very small amount, maybe two, three, four percent at most coming from polyunsaturated fatty acids in most of those diets. So would you say that the diets varied also, obviously, depending on what was available, where people lived, should we take that into account as we're trying to make our choices in terms of percentage of fat in our own diets? Are you asking me whether we should take into account where we live right now or our ancestry and where our ancestors lived? Ah, good question. (laughs) What about both? Okay. I think that where we live is not that important. So where we live now is not that important. And the reason is that humans are warm-blooded, and as a result, the temperature in our own bodies is relatively constant regardless of what the ambient temperature is. If you look at why is it 
that coconut oil is so high in saturated fat and that olive oil is so high in monounsaturated fat one of the driving forces of this is the ambient temperature in those regions. So plants don't have any blood, and plants can't regulate their, their body temperature, so to speak, the way that we can. And so they are very much victims of the ambient temperature. And saturated fats work really, really, really well in warm temperatures, whereas unsaturated fats work really, really, really well in cold temperatures. So if you take, for example, a fish that's swimming in really cold water, that fish is going to have a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acid because that fish is really, really cold and it needs to regulate the fluidity of all its membranes. Mm -hmm. And so for the people who, who, I mean, I think a lot of people already know this, but probably there are some people listening uh, who could benefit from this. If you, uh, if you just imagine how the fats and oils behave in your kitchen, you can get a sense of why this is important. So if you take, for example, butter, if you refrigerate it, it's going to be pretty solid. And if it's cool in your, you know, if it's 60 or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the butter is probably going to be at least a semi-solid, if not a solid at room temperature. But if you leave it out in the summer and it's getting into 70 or 80, it'll start to melt. Mm -hmm. By contrast, if you take something like olive oil, which is monounsaturated, at room temperature, it'll be a liquid, and if you put it in the refrigerator, it will take a while, but over the course of probably a few days, it'll really start to solidify. If you take something like corn oil, which is really polyunsaturated, you can put it in the fridge, and you can just keep it in the fridge endlessly, and it'll never solidify. So the more saturated you are, the, the more solid things are, mm -hmm. and the more unsaturated you are, the more liquid things are, but by contrast heat makes everything liquefy. It melts things, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're in the tropics, the plants need to have saturated fat. If you're in cold, cold water, the fish need to have polyunsaturated fat. If you are an olive hanging off a tree in the Mediterranean, you need to be somewhere in the middle. But for the humans, uh, you know, if I am in the Arctic, my body temperature is going to be roughly the same as it is if I'm in a temperate zone. It's going to be roughly the same as it is when I'm in the equator because once I consume things, my body regulates how fluid everything is. And so it's not that important where I am at this moment. What is important, I think, potentially, is where our ancestors come from. Have you seen the Nourishing Traditions Cookbook for Children? Everyone in your family is going to love this spiral-bound, fully illustrated version of Nourishing Traditions. It's available at bookstores, online booksellers, and at NewTrendsPublishing.com. And keep in mind that case orders are 50% off at NewTrendsPublishing.com. And are you enjoying these podcasts? You can hear speakers like those featured here in person at the Wise Traditions Conference in Montgomery, Alabama this November. I'm going to be there, and I can't wait. You will have opportunities to delve deeper, ask questions, and connect with people who care about nourishing their health through nutrient-dense foods just like you do. Go to wisetraditions.org for details. And now back to the program. If you look at the process of evolution, what happens is not that the environment makes us automatically suited to the environment, but if there's variation in how well someone tolerates carbohydrate versus how well do they tolerate fat versus how well do they tolerate saturated versus monounsaturated versus polyunsaturated fat, if that variation exists, then an environment that's dominated by one of those things is going to tend to just naturally automatically select for people who have the characteristics that thrive in that environment. So if some people do better on saturated fat than monounsaturated fat, historically, the people with those genetics would have thrived in the tropical regions where saturated fat was common, and people with the opposite characteristics would be more likely to thrive in the Mediterranean region where saturated was lower and monounsaturated was higher. So I don't think we can assume that because our ancestors were from a particular region, we need to exactly replicate that diet, mm -hmm. but I think we can consider it more likely and more probable that that environment of our ancestors may impact 
how we eat today. So what do we do with that knowledge? Well, I think in five or 10 years from now, one of the things that we'll do with that knowledge is be able to have really easy access to a lot of information about our own genetics that'll help us make decisions like that. Now you can get those genetic tests, but it's not really ready for prime time in terms of finding useful, actionable things from it. So what I think we can do now is self-experiment. So you start saying, all right, I'm going to eat a mix of monounsaturated and, and saturated fats with a small supplement of polyunsaturated. So I'll stick to the traditional oils. I'm not going to put beef tallow on my salad. I'll put olive oil on my salad, yeah. but, but I might use ghee or butter for cooking. I might use you know, tallow or whatever, depending on what the meal is. And then you see how your body responds. And you take things like, how well do I feel? Or if we take objective measurements from the blood when we go to the doctor's office, what is that saying about our health? Mm -hmm. And we integrate that information. You know, what are, we, we, don't, we don't emphasize one over the other. You know, if you feel great and, you're getting, and your doctor doesn't think you're in the best shape, you need to critically think about why that discrep discrepancy exists. You don't just assume that the blood test overrides your personal experience. But you try to take both of those into account and you fiddle with your diet if you need to. And you may find that switching to olive oil versus butter works better for you. Or you may find that switching to butter versus olive oil works better for you. That's something that each of us needs to flesh out for ourselves through trial and error and, you know, listening to our bodies and to the feedback that we get from any of the measurements that we might take through our own, you know, healthcare regimen. Well, let's say that I make some adjustments to my diet and I hit some kind of sweet spot. What will my doctor see that says you're in the right zone, you're in the right spot for your body? Uh, well, I think that the way the healthcare system is set up, we don't necessarily, <laughs> we unfortunately don't really necessarily look for, for sweet spots so much as we look for things being out of the range um, to, to treat a problem. But I think that, you know, if you're talking about your personal experience, then I think, uh, you know, some of the key things that you want to look for in your health and I'm not sure this is news to anyone, but you know, you want to you want to be getting good sleep. You want to be waking up feeling rested. You want to feel alert and energetic during the day. You want your stress level to be relatively slow. You want to be able to feel like you're physiologically adapted to handle the stressors that come your way. So your mood and how you think about the challenges in life are very much about your choices in your approach to life, but they're also very much about your physiology. So if you find that you your physiology is well equipped to allow you to have good control over your mood and good control over your response to challenges, and you know, of course, different people have different goals, but if you are an athlete, then one of the things you want to look at is your athletic performance. If you are someone who works with information uh, then you want to be primarily interested in maximizing your cognitive performance. You know, you, any person can pick a particular set of goals that they have or a particular job that they have to do and can come up with their own list of how do I need to feel and how, how does my body need to be equipped in order to be able to reach these goals. And I think that's going to vary from person to person. And in turn, those goals are very much going to impact how someone eats as well. So you can take, if you were to take a brother and sister, two identical twins or, you know, Jack and Jill from different families, but who are, you know, have a similar heritage and a similar genetics and all the things that we talked about before. Mm -hmm. And you take one of those people and they become an athlete and you take the other one of those people and they become a public speaker. It's not just that they have different set of goals the physiological framework that's needed to support those goals is very different. So the, mm -hmm. the athlete is going to have to eat differently than the, than the public speaker is going to have to eat. And so I think if you, you know, there's a set of things like what I talked about at the beginning, your sleep and your alertness and your mood and stuff like that. I think there's a kind of a set of things that you can identify for how you feel. But I think you really need to, everyone could benefit by sitting down and thinking about what exactly are their goals in life and what are they doing, not just in terms of 
accomplishments, but what are they doing to support their body in a way that's specifically helpful to those goals? Uh, I think you know the other part of your question is what is your what is your doctor going to see? That's sort of a, a whole can of worms that we could talk about for a whole another forty five minutes. Yeah. But I think some of the things that uh, people are when they're talking about fats that they're most concerned about is their cholesterol levels, and the doctor in most cases is going to have a particular framework for identifying cholesterol levels that are too high, and they're you know more often than than not they're going to treat that the high cholesterol is a problem that is treatable with a drug rather than trying to come back to your to your diet to talk about that but i think you know overwhelmingly when people are talking about saturated fat versus monounsaturated fat versus polyunsaturated fat the number one doctor's test that they're concerned about is their is their cholesterol levels and i you know i have a i have a little bit of a different take on cholesterol levels than what you see in the mainstream, but I still do think that cholesterol can often be a red flag. So if you see uh, cholesterol levels that are for men significantly over 220 or for women, uh, particularly, I would say for, for postmenopausal women, it can go higher than that, but significantly over 250. And if you have a total to HDL cholesterol ratio, that's pretty far above three. So, you know, maybe four is not panic mode, but five, six, or seven. If you see that, I, I wouldn't necessarily conclude anything about your diet, but that's when I would start looking around at other things that might be going on because one of the reasons that your cholesterol levels can rise high is not not necessarily because there's more cholesterol in your body, but because you're not using it properly. Mm. And one of the good things that cholesterol does is it's used as the raw material to make sex hormones. So one of the things that I would look at in those cases is what do your sex hormones look like? And one of the things that governs turning cholesterol into sex hormones is thyroid hormone. And so if I Mm. see cholesterol that high, I would say, what does your thyroid hormone profile look like? And that's not really a cookie cutter approach where we can say on the podcast, this cholesterol level, do that. But it's something where what I would say is, you know, if you see your cholesterol levels rising really high mm-hmm. and that red flag goes up, find a healthcare practitioner who really understands, you know, who goes beyond the treat the cholesterol with the drug approach and really understands the metabolic pathways and how all the hormones are, are being governed and can help you um, sort of can play biological detective and figure out, you know, is your cholesterol high because of some good reason or is it high because of some backup in your metabolism? How do we find that backup in your metabolism? and How can we treat that naturally before we go on to drugs? I think that would be the best thing to do. Mm-hmm. Well, Chris, this has been an awesome conversation. I've learned a lot about fat and I'm imagining myself as a little olive on a tree in the Mediterranean. <laughs> that image is going to stick with me. But please, what are some final things that you want to tell our listeners about uh, the benefits of fat and its role in our bodies? All right. Well, for the hardcore listeners who really want to understand more about the biology of saturated fats, I'd like to direct those listeners to my article, Saturated Fat Does a Body Good, which is up on westonaprice.org. And that is based on a talk that I gave at this year's Wise Traditions, but converted into article form. And so if you want to geek out on the science of saturated fats, definitely read that. And then I would say to everyone, I think what we need to do here is kind of move out of this out of this position of fear that we've been placed in and into a position of freedom. And we want to be really careful when we do that, not to re-demonize other things in in traditional diets that we haven't been demonizing in the past. And what I mean by that is now that we can all agree that saturated fat plays important roles in the body and we need to look at saturated fat as a positive thing and view it from a viewpoint of freedom, what we don't want to do is come out and demonize polyunsaturated fat altogether or demonize carbohydrate, for example. So we need to get out of this pendulum swinging back and forth between which nutrient is our favorite one and which nutrient is the villain. And we need to move forward uh, in, in a more of a place of freedom where we can look at all the different parts of the menu of traditional diets and 
put together the mix that works best for us and really listen to our bodies to try to figure out what that mix is. That's fantastic. What is one thing you would recommend that our listener do to improve their health? I would say the best thing that you can do is, and because everyone is coming at a different place, I think the best thing that you can do is just take an hour or two hours on a weekend out to catalog the different things in your life that you're doing and and why you're doing them. And I think many of us kind of float through life on autopilot and we kind of do things because we've been doing them or because we heard about other people doing them or because everyone was talking about them and we're not really asking ourselves, why am I doing this and how is it promoting my goals? And from the perspective of health, I think what you can do, I mean, you could do this from the perspective of any goal, but from the perspective of health, you know, sit down and think about, you know, what is, what is the hour or so where I go to bed look like? What is the hour or so when I wake up look like? What food choices am I making and why am I making them? And if you do that and you actually just step back and think about it, you may be able to identify a lot of things that you, when you ask the question, why am I doing this? you find that the answer is something besides because I know from experience that this makes me feel better or because I know from experience that this improves my athletic performance or improves how my brain feels or improves my mood or something like that. And when we start to get those answers to that question, we can continue to catalog and say, okay, what if I turned this around and started making a food choice because it was making me do better at my athletics or do better at my cognitive tasks or better control my mood. Uh, just doing that can help anyone find one or two or three things that they could probably change in that moment or in the week that follows that could really impact their health. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to get on that. I love this. It reminds me just of intentional living, right? We don't want to do things just because someone else said it or you know it was some kind of trend we really want to look and examine our lives carefully and make choices to improve our health intentionally so thank you Absolutely. so much chris i've enjoyed this conversation a lot i hope we get to talk to you again sometime soon thank you hilda it was great to be here same my guest today was chris master john the article he mentioned saturated fat does a body good can be found on the podcast page of the westonaprice.org website if you want to hear more from Chris, look for his blog and podcast called The Daily Lipid. You can also find him on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Snapchat under his name, Chris Master John. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with others. Post a link on Facebook or Twitter, or send a link to a friend in an email, or simply review Wise Traditions on iTunes. Sharing the podcast is one way to spread the important message of health through nutrition. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions and Food Farming in the Healing Arts. The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice.